Steve Luckert. I'm the senior program curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, my, my name is Ilya Soman. I'm a law professor at George Mason University. Uh, I'm, I'm, yes. <laughs> Either George Mason grads or uh, students in law school, I'm not sure which, but either way, welcome. Uh, and uh, I've also, while my primary fields are writing about things like federalism and political ignorance and the like, I've also written a number of articles about fantasy and science fiction literature and the portrayal of politics therein, which is probably why I've been invited to this event. I'm Morgan from Amazon. Uh, I'm Kevin Banks. I'm the director of the uh, Open Technology Institute at New America, where I work on a variety of uh, in, uh, technology issues like surveillance and such, but also a huge science fiction here. Morgan, I know you talked a little bit uh, about it in the intro, but can you expand? Well, I started at Amazon Studios about two years ago, and uh, it was out of pure desperation that I started to call producers who I previously worked with. Um, we had really no development to speak of and needed uh, to jumpstart things. And we have a big, rabid fan base that loves science fiction that on, on the service. And so I called Frank Spotnitz, who I had worked with at ABC. We had done a show called Night Stalker. And Frank was always a fantastic writer-producer. And I called him and I said, Frank, what is the thing that you have that you haven't been able to get made that you love, that you are really passionate about. Because, you know, people will pitch you like five things if you say, what do you got? If you say, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? It uh, limits the list greatly. Right. And he said, the man in the high castle. And, and where to go from there? So you started to look into it and... Yeah, he sent me um, two scripts that had been completed and outlines for the other two. And originally what um, they had done it the Sci-Fi Channel was develop a four-hour miniseries. They wanted to basically do the scope of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and we were not particularly interested in doing a miniseries. We thought this could really work as an ongoing series. And we asked them when we picked it up to do some additional development work on uh, the other outlines to kind of recalibrate it for uh, a more ongoing series. And the rest is history. Uh, Steve, you have uh, written books on Nazi propaganda. What was your reaction? Well, obviously, we saw some a lot of propaganda there in that first episode. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing the way it integrates a lot of Nazi imagery, even some of the buildings, the kind of monumental architecture that's used in there. I mean, there's some that kind of allude to, for instance, the the German pavilion at the 1937. Uh, World's Fair in Paris, mm -hmm. the, the Japanese, the German embassy in uh, in the Japanese uh, occupied areas, and so there was a very and there was also ways that were kind of subtly brought in, for instance, Nazi policy towards degenerate art, and also Nazi policy towards the murder of uh, people with disabilities. Uh, Ilya, you've uh, written about the politics of science fiction. What was what was your reaction? Uh, so, obviously, I think it brings up a number of political themes. Uh, there's many we could probably talk about. One that struck me is that the series, and like the book, takes a position, I think, on this long-standing debate about whether the rise of something like Nazism is caused by something specific to German culture in particular, or whether there's just sort of more universal tendencies, which means that the same thing could happen in any society under the right circumstances, including in America, and obviously I think the series seems to be much more in that second camp of suggesting that under right circumstances, Americans would behave very much like the Germans did. So you see many of the people in the uh, film accepting more or less unquestioningly the precepts of the Germans and the Japanese, including most strikingly the police officer who seems like a very nice man, but accepts unquestioningly the idea that it's perfectly fine to execute the mentally ill and the handicapped, as was Nazi policy. So there's a sense that uh, you know, there's a common flaw in human nature which leads to this and that most people, whether Germans or Americans or Japanese, tend to accept the dominant ideology of their society and to accept the status quo without necessarily questioning it very much. Kevin, you're an expert on uh, surveillance, U.S. surveillance. Uh, what was your take on it as well as you're also, you've also written a lot about free speech? 
Well, so uh, as a uh, civil libertarian and privacy advocate who works on tech policy, I was a little sad not to see more surveillance in a vision of totalitarian America or communications, because if we're building a technical infrastructure like that, if ever we don't hold to our constitutional principles, we've developed something that looks like turnkey totalitarianism, like something that could actually be used against us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great premise. I mean, uh, uh, as Morgan knows, the, the, the best, uh, all movies are basically what if. And this is a great what if based uh, on a word winning book. Uh, Morgan, is there anything, like a lot of books and movies, you mentioned 1984, uh, about uh, political leaders and politics, Brave the World, Enemy of the State, which came out before 9 11, which I thought was a movie before its time, Wag the Dog, Manchurian Candy. Um, is there anything that, that this reminded you of? I think one of the things that's so special about this show is that you haven't seen anything like it before. And uh, that is really one of the things that we're actively trying to do, is to do the kind of thought-provoking, original you know, content that you know, other places just aren't doing. And it's probably why it took so long for this to get made. It's, obviously challenging material and you know if you're a traditional network and you have to go tell the marketing department like yeah we just picked up the show about Nazis and you know <laughs> do you want to sell a Volkswagen integration like, you know, <laughs> not exactly the easiest conversation to have right 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 interesting um, uh, Ilya what about uh, looking at the similarities uh, between good and evil uh, throughout the decades and do you see uh, similarities between now the U.S. Uh, fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, pa any parallels that you see in, in this series and what's going on currently? Uh, so I don't know that the series was inspired specifically by things going on with Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Obviously, you can see some potential parallels in that some of the practices used by the Nazis and the Japanese, like large-scale use of forced labor, mass murder, and the like. We certainly see ISIS doing those things, not quite at the same scale, but only because they don't control as large uh, a territory. The other thing, obviously, that uh, you see is that both Nazism and Japanese nationalism of the kind that you see with the Japanese Empire are essentially nationalistic and highly xenophobic movements, and obviously those are some of the most extreme possible forms of those movements, but uh, you see them arise in other times of crisis and other places, including in Western Europe and the U.S. today with uh, some of the hostility towards immigration, the current debate over Syrian refugees and the like. I wouldn't say it would be silly to say, well, Donald Trump is just like Hitler, obviously. While I think he's bad, he's not as bad as that. Uh, but there are commonalities in the sense that he, too, is appealing to xenophobia and to the sense that if things are going wrong, the people who must be responsible are some sort of foreigners or some sort of other. And it's psychologically easier often to blame those groups for our problems than to blame ourselves. And while the xenophobia that uh, has arisen in the U.S. and in Western Europe in recent years is not on the same scale as what you saw in the 1930s in Germany and elsewhere, uh, there are still some commonalities. Uh, and you know, to some extent, you, you see that channeled in uh, the series, maybe a little bit more in later episodes than in this one, with uh, many of the characters accepting these sort of racist and xenophobic ideologies that the Nazis and the Japanese were promoting. Uh, Steve, uh, you mentioned it, uh, the refugees, and, and they have been compared to the Jews uh, in the 1940s. Uh, do you see similarities in the xenophobia uh, and the debate going on right now? Well, I think there's some interesting parallels for, to that time period. Uh, and I think in some ways this is a quintessentially American story that's told in this, in this film. It's not the... In the 1930s, for instance, in the United States, there was a great fear of uh, foreign influence in the United States. For instance, in fear of the Nazis would come in. You had congressional investigations beginning in 1934, detailed looking into Nazi subversion in the United States. Out, growing out of that is HUAC, the House on Un-American Activities, which began in 1938 as a result of look into that. There was a fear that, that 
that the United States could go fascist. But it was more the, th the threat, not from military occupation, but that you would have internal groups that would do that. And I think this film kind of addresses that. That kind of fear of, of foreign influence also was something that plays out particularly after the, uh, the German swift invasion of Western Europe. Because then there were all kinds of stories. How did the, how did the Nazis were able, how were they able to do that? Remember, this was unparalleled to take out all these countries in a matter of weeks, sometimes days. France is defeated in in uh, you know a matter of weeks, and of course people are saying oh, it's because of the fifth column uh -huh. that this is it. And they identified there were those that in the government, among respected journalists and others who were saying well, maybe refugee, that refugees can be blackmailed, or that you would have fake refugees infiltrating those countries and subverting that order. And that was a very popular theme in 1940, 1941. So the fear of that somehow refugees or people who could be acting as Nazi agents or foreign agents was a very common one in the United States. You know, when I was watching that, that episode, I, I was, when they were making phone calls, I was thinking, no, don't use the phone. But, but this is set in the 1960s, uh, Kevin. So, uh, just want to get your take on now, fast forward to, to now, you have now a, a raging debate on encryption, especially after the Paris attacks. Some small aspects of what the NSA is doing, but I'd say, on a macro level, where things are going is a the normalization of the idea that governments should have black boxes sitting on our networks where they're allowed to sift through the data. And we're seeing this um, in uh, the UK where there's a bill that would be even much more aggressive than what we're allowed to do here. And on encryption, there's a concern uh, that uh, there are bad guys who will use uh, secure tools to communicate with each other securely. Then again, there's also the concern that, well, millions of normal, ordinary people also use these tools, and we want them to be secure as well. And trying to drill back doors into these tools is actually going to make all this less secure against all kinds of attackers. And I think that, um, hmm, I think that Philip K. Dick was worried about, to some extent, emerging you know, right-wing uh, uh, tendencies uh, in the government. Uh, and also looking at things from sort of the insurgent point of view. And I, I think it's, it's worth remembering that in many ways, our constitution, like our country was founded on a sort of pro-insurgency basis, like the, 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 the founders were insurgents and they wanted us to be able to uh, um, you know, stand up to the government if necessary. And if we are building a system where we are never able to securely communicate uh, and the government can always uh, tap into our calls or read our email or open up the mics on our cell phones or our laptops or our video cams on our laptops, you know, that's actually a profoundly, I think, worrisome vision. And I think our founders would be pretty freaked out about it. Um, but you also mentioned technology and fast forwarding. It's worth noting that in the books, actually, the Nazis have already colonized Mars by this point in the timeline, which actually sort of raises an interesting point about how, you know, as, as George W. Bush said, fascism might be easier and maybe even more effective. Like, if we had Nazis in charge, maybe we'd be on Mars by now, but like, at what cost? <laughs> uh, that, that's actually a point that I think Frank Spotnitz and Issa Takakit and Ridley and Zucker were really focused on, which is to show all of the, the gray in this, that there are some kinds of advancements, the fact that there are rocket ships that you know, can allow you to you know, zoom back and forth from Berlin in a matter of hours, and you know, people have jobs and crime is relatively low. You know, there are some things that were good for some people, obviously not for everyone, but um, some people actually had it pretty good in this time. And as the series goes on, we, we definitely explore uh, some of those aspects to it. I wanted to add something about, you know, we're talking about science fiction. To some people it's not obvious how alternate history is science fiction, but it is painting a portrait of a world that's different from ours, that's meant to comment on ours, and that's what the best science fiction does. But Philip K. Dick, who wrote this book, um, wrote a lot of very clearly science fiction stuff, was also, not for nothing, a, a borderline personality schizophrenic, and so a lot of his work focused on 
being watched, being controlled, uh, what is real and what is not. And you know, we have this film reel in, in, in the movie, uh, in the show, called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which seems to show a wholly different world where the Allies won. And I think that we all know here, sitting here, that there is an element of truth to that. Um, you know, it was a book in the book. There was a novel within the novel in the book. Now we have a movie within a movie. And I think it's interesting, going back to my comments about dystopia and utopia, we're act there's an interesting symmetry because the characters in the movie are in relation to that film uh, in the same position we are in relation to this, but in reverse. They are seeing a narrative that portrays a much more positive vision of their world, while we are sitting outside it watching a very negative version of, of ours. And I just find that interesting and very Philip K. Dickian. <laughs> just on, on that, it's interesting that in the series, uh, you guys are involved in a production, maybe you can correct me on this, but in the series it seems like the alternate world in the movie is pretty much our world, whereas in the book, the alternate book is a world where the U.S. and Britain win the war, and things actually come out much better than they came out in the real world in 1962, that both the U.S. and Britain are doing much better, the Soviet Union isn't very much of a power, and so forth. Uh, it, so I wonder if that difference is intentional, or perhaps maybe you can't reveal because it's not till season two that we find out what the truth of this is, but it seems to me that, that there is a divergence in that in the book, Philip K. Dick is suggesting an alternate history is oversimplified and tends to go to extremes, either uh, the very negative one in, the book, in his book or the overly positive one in the book within the book, whereas uh, if, you're actually, if the alternate history here within the story is just our own history, maybe that's a different message.